Sherry Sager, Sager joined Lucille Packard Children's Hospital at Stanford in 1994, and she continues to serve as the Chief Government and Community Relations Officer. She has more than 30 years of experience in government, having worked as staff for elected officials on all levels of government. She's managed political campaigns, wait and talk with her at the intermission, as well as having served as a volunteer on city and county task forces and commissions. And Sherry's title is um, Children's Hospitals and the Importance of Health Insurance and Medicaid for Children with Disabilities and Special Care Needs. Welcome to the podium. Thank you, Lisa. <coughs> Thank you. I was just whispering to Lucy that the most difficult task for me today will be to stay on point with my slides because I want to I want to uh, work off of what Amy was just saying and and I kept thinking of all these things I wanted to say but um, I should let you know ahead of time I tend to do that because I think those are those are important things and so I'm really grateful for the the privilege of speaking here today and I thank Lucy so much for thinking of us and me and, and my colleague Lisa Chamberlain who will follow. But I want to start before I start my formal slides with a couple of um, sort of preliminary comments. Way back when, when I worked for a member of the state legislature, one of the most organized and informed groups were the dis dis developmental disabilities group. And I was the district director for a state legislator and they'd come in and they'd say, teach us all about advocacy. How do we get some changes? Because at that time, not unlike now, state budget was in trouble and there were threats to funding programs. So I've always found the developmentally disabled community willing to step up to the plate, tell their story, share it, and say, this is important to us. You need to talk to us. You, you know, we vote. Um, and I can't, I, I would, if I were writing this, I would put it in bold, I'd highlight it, and I'd underline it. We vote. It makes a difference. The other preliminary comment <clears throat> is it's always very discouraging to me when I'm talking to somebody in Washington, D.C. especially, and they're an elected official or they work for an elected official, and they confuse the terms Medicare and Medicaid. And it happens way more than it should since it shouldn't happen at all. The key is Medicare is funded by all of us who work through payroll taxes. Medicaid comes from the general fund. And it is not only the safety net for folks who are low income, but it is the safety net for anyone who has high medical bills with the idea that you don't go broke because of high medical costs. So part of my job is stereotype breaking, is I, I won't let people get away with saying, oh, those poor people, they're just on welfare and they don't do anything to deserve it. That's baloney. And part of what we have to do is put a face on who's on Medicaid or in California, Medi-Cal. The one other, um, point I would make is that the formula, Amy went through and talked to you about the formula, the FMAP, it's an antiquated formula, but we can't change it. It's antiquated because it's based on both the state's poverty level and a per capita. Well, California has one of the highest poverty rates in the country, so you would think that our rate would be so much higher. Well, we have a little problem in that we've got <clears throat> the Bay Area. More specifically, we've got Silicon Valley in San Francisco. Drives up the per capita income for the entire state. So while we have one of the highest poverty rates, we also have the highest per capita, which keeps us at that 50%. It's problematic. <clears throat> but we're never going to get that change, unfortunately, because there are more states than us, and they have the votes. 
The other big difference between Medicare and Medicaid, and it comes in here, is that Medicare is a federal program with that says here are all the things you have to do. It may be implemented on a state by state basis or a region, region but there are clear federal guidelines. It is a federal program. Medicaid has a federal umbrella who says you have to do these kinds of things, but beyond that, you can do what you want. And it's really, <coughs> thank you, because <coughs> I lose my voice, which is probably not a bad thing. <coughs> there are 54 different Medicaid programs in the country. One Medicare program, 54 Medicaid programs. It makes a huge difference when you're trying to advocate, when you're trying to make changes, when you're trying to protect the program. Le but neither Lisa or I have anything to disclose. And so I want to talk more deeply about who are the children that are covered by Medicaid and CHIP? CHIP stands for the Children's Health Insurance Program. And when Congress first passed CHIP, they said, okay, we've taken care of kids. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Let's move on. Mm, not quite true. Almost half of the children with special health care needs are covered by either Medicaid and CHIP. And in 2008, in the last recession with a big R in California, we combined the CHIP program into the Medi-Cal program. So even within our Medi-Cal program in California, we have two different F maps because the kids on CHIP, um, it's a 65, 35% match. So the federal government pays 65% of the cost, the state pays 35%. But it's all blended together to create our big Medicaid program. Be, as each state is different, so the cost or the share of children with special health care need, health care needs, can vary from 23 percent to 67 percent. You heard Amy say they might have all the eligibility requirements, but they cap how much the funding is, so that limits. I talk to my colleagues at Texas Children's all the time who are lamenting that the state's already run out of money and there's kids on waiting lists who are eligible but the state has no money. 75% of Medicaid CHIP children with special health care needs live in families below 200% of the federal poverty level. The federal poverty level is roughly $16,000 for a family of three. So you're talking about $32,000. I don't know that you are surviving very well anywhere in the state of California, but definitely not in the Bay Area. This is Tyler. Tyler is one of my advocates. I took Tyler back to Washington, D.C. with me two years ago when he was four. He's now six. And um, when I called mom, because I, I actually have written permission, and I called mom to say, is it okay if I... Uh, I'm doing this conference, I want to show the pictures from D.C. with Tyler and show his care map, which you'll see in a little bit. She said, here, let me give you his updated photo. So I think it's okay for me to talk about Tyler. Tyler was born um, with half a heart. And his parents were told he had, they had two options. They could bring him home. He was 32 hours old at this point. They could bring him home and say goodbye, or they could have them airlifted to Packard. Now, this is a family that plans everything. They dated for a long time and said, okay, we've saved up money, we can get married. They got married, saved up money, said, okay, we could buy our house. They bought their house, saved up money, and said, okay, we could start our family, started our family. And they did something that most of us don't even think about. They bought helicopter insurance, life flight insurance um, in their health plan, because. You know, you just never know. <laughs> and, um, and then she went into, mom went into labor prematurely. Tyler was born. That was their option. They said, life flight him to Packard. He got to Packard before, well, mom was still in the hospital. Um, before dad got there, he was already into surgery before 
Um, Dad even got there. Turns out, though, their helicopter insurance was for the wrong helicopter company, and so it didn't cover. Um, but we take care of things like that. It's one of the things that children's hospitals tend to do. And we don't want families to go broke either. And so we actually, through our financial counseling, took care of it. Now I have to tell you, this family also has primary health insurance through dad's job, secondary health insurance through mom's job, and Medicaid to cover all of the ancillary services and wraparound services. They could not survive without that. Dad makes choices about where he works because he wants the because of the health insurance. So he makes the commute from Scotts Valley to San Jose every day in order to make sure that Tyler gets the coverage that Tyler needs. For me, that's a red flag, something we need to do, to do something about. That's not okay. They should be just able to focus on doing the right thing for their family. And having dad working closer to home would sure help a lot. So what are the demographics? Who are the kids that are on Medicaid or CHIP and have special health care needs? Well, 7% of them have are f incomes that are 400% of the federal poverty level. This is throughout the U.S., so it's not just California. 43% are less than 100% of the federal poverty level. As any of you who work with or are somebody with a developmental disability, you know that it's hard to hold down a full-time job. Even when you want to, whether you're a caretaker, caregiver, it's, it's just tough to do that. And we don't make it any easier, so it's really important that we continue to be able to provide Medicaid so that at least families know that they have health coverage. Their race ethnicity, 40% are non-Hispanic white, 29% are Hispanic, 22% are non-Hispanic African American. So if you start looking at how our population in the country breaks down, this is pretty similar. So again, we're going to bust a stereotype. It's not all people of color. Um, it is everyone. It can hit anyone's family. Now, we're going to start seeing the, this age change. It used to be you had a lot higher numbers in the zero to five, higher percentages. And then as they got older, they got smaller, the percentages. Well, one of the good things is that through medical research and technology, we're saving not only are we saving a lot of children and families, but we're giving them a quality of life. Because we often hear, oh, well, there's an ethical issue. Um, you know, you're saving these children, but now there's this huge cost to society for taking care of them. Well, guess what? When we, t when we save children's lives, when we give them a productive life, they give back. And we get those back in, um, in all sorts of ways. So it's a good thing to be doing, but it changes our age breakdown. The other myth is ah, all this money is going to all these kids. Two thirds of Medicaid spending is for elderly and then people with disabilities. And a lot of the elderly who have disabilities qualify, and if they're low income, they qualify, and you hear them referred to as Medi Medis. They have Medicare and Medicaid. So Medicaid covers their premiums and other services that are not covered by Medicare. It makes a difference. For children are 43%. We usually add um, in um, pregnant women because they're covered if they're low income by Medicaid as well. And as a children's hospital that actually has a pretty robust labor and delivery, we're as interested in that number. So you, about 50% of the people on Medicaid are women and, and children. And most of those children are healthy children. And there's some children in the disabled bucket as well. The expenditures, this is the one that's key. Only 19% of the expenditures go to children. 40% of the Medicaid expenditures go to folks who are disabled. 
So what does Medicaid mean for children? It, you know, Medicaid and CHIP, it benefits the entire family, not just the child. Um, it provides access to care. They're cost-effective programs. When children are healthy, they're less likely to miss school. They're healthier into adulthood. They can earn higher wages. And then guess what? They can pay more taxes and keep the cycles going. Um, I, I have, uh, I'm doing a lot of work these days on um, adolescent mental health, and I have a lot of frustration because everybody wants to, to you know, solve the folks who are, who are uh, mentally ill coming into the emergency rooms, and I'm like, that's important, but if we would put some money into kids and into prevention, we might be able to reduce those costs when they get to adulthood because we will have solved the issue. Um, and let's put more dollars into prevention, into caring for children and teens, whether it's physical health and mental health, and please, 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 let's get rid of the silos. Let's encourage integrated health care. Um, it's better for everyone. Medicaid enables low-income children to receive that needed care without co-payments and deductibles. I often hear people say, and legislators or legislative staff say, well, if, if people would buy into the system, you know, a copay, $50, it's no big deal. I want to ask them if they would spend a week living um, either as someone with a disability or on a limited budget that would qualify for Medicaid and then tell me that $50 is no big deal. I want them to have to make that decision. I have $50, my kid's healthy this, this week, this month. Do I pay a, for health premium that we don't need? Do I make a rent payment or do I buy food for my kids? I can tell you which one comes out on bottom. It's an inexpensive way to cover children. And when parents are covered, which is what the Affordable Care Act allowed us to do, children are more likely to receive the preventative health care because parents and kids are doing this together. And it increases access to prenatal care, which reduces infant mortality and morbidity. And we saw it um, with the passage of the Affordable Care Act. For three years, from 2014 to last year, we were seeing those numbers. And then, as Lisa knows, Dr. Chamberlain knows, my favorite sentence is, Medicaid is the underpinning of the entire health care system for children. <clears throat> and I want to repeat that. Medicaid is the underpinning for the entire health care system for children. That means... <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. See, she's always being a caregiver. Um, I don't care how much money you make, how good your health insurance is, if you're children's hospital, whether it's part of a large system like the UCs or part of an independent nonprofit like Packard, if we haven't been able to hire the right specialists, one, because they are few and far between, or two, because we don't have enough volume to guarantee that they have an expertise, not only is that care not there for a child on Medicaid, that care isn't there for any child. So to have a healthy children's health system, you need Medicaid. Volume equals expertise. There is a reason why, um, and I hope anybody here at UCSF doesn't take offense, but there is a reason why Packard is the number one pediatric transplant program in the country. It's because it's able to have the volume and it takes care of children on, on Medicaid from multiple states. What Medicaid means for children's hospitals is that children's hospitals, by and large, see more Medicaid patients than the vast majority of other hospitals. Your first response is going to say, I, I don't think so, Sherry. What about those public hospitals? You've got public hospitals all through the state. They take care of low-income children, and they take care of Medicaid. You're right, they do. And they take care of Medicare, and they take care of uninsured. And when you look at the percentage of Medicaid, it's actually higher in children's hospitals because we don't take care of Medicare. 
So Packard is on the low end. We're only 43% Medicaid. Children's Hospital Los Angeles is hovering between 75 and 80%, as is Children's Hospital Oakland, or now, as it's known, UCSF Benioff Oakland. Valley Children's Hospital, the same thing. So Medicaid is really the foundation, and when you cut Medicaid, there, there isn't any place to go. In California, um, and, and what this does, as I said, is it allows for that much needed pediatric expertise. It's also the foundation of financial sustainability for children's hospitals. We depend on those supplemental programs. What, again, if you're a public hospital is called DISH, disproportionate share, but for private hospitals and children's hospitals, it's called supplemental payment or it's DISH lookalike. It's identical rules to qualify for DISH. It's just not called DISH because of funding streams, which is all back of the um, room. Graduate medical education, the provider fee. Sometimes adult hospitals get really upset because children's hospitals get the biggest proportion of the provider fee in the state of California. Well, there are two reasons. We have the most beds covered by Medicaid, and we pay the highest provider taxes. So the, the formula is you get back based on how many Medi-Cal patients you serve and how many, what the utilization is. I can tell you for Packard, that's about $65 million a year, the provider fee. We don't qualify for DISH. We're in the absolute worst place you could possibly be. We miss qualifying by about 1%. Missing by 1% costs us $10 million. But it is what it is. So we are very dependent and appreciative of the provider fee. Some of my colleagues are at children's hospitals where they're receiving hundreds of millions of dollars, and it literally is the only way they're able to keep programs operating. And people say, well, but it's a tax, so we should cut all taxes. Um, this is a tax that we, I'm not sure gladly is the right term, but we gladly um, pay on our, pay ourselves and, and, and have voted ourselves to self-tax ourselves in order to be able to draw down these federal dollars because these are dollars that the state of California was leaving on the table. California was eligible for these dollars based on the federal government's formula, but there wasn't enough money in the state general fund to be able to draw the dollars down. So by taxing ourselves as hospitals, we give that money to the state to be able to bring those dollars down from the federal government. So don't let anyone tell you that California is getting more than its fair share. It's not. And California, even with this, is still a donor state to the federal government. And I wanted to tie it in because I can't do a presentation like this without at least touching on the Affordable Care Act, and then I will try to wrap it up so I leave enough time for Dr. Chamberlain. Because the Affordable Care Act, especially for kids and especially for folks with disabilities, is a lifesaver. It means no annual caps, no lifetime caps, and you couldn't be discriminated on buying health insurance because of that disability. That was important. It's important to our patients, and we will continue to strongly advocate for that. The future of Medicaid, the challenges, Amy touched on some. There will be attempts to continue to repeal all of the Affordable Care Act, especially the Medicaid expansions, to cut eligibility requirements, to cut benefits. Make no mistake, if you do block grants or per capita, it's cutting funding, because then they put it in a block grant, they don't see anybody's face, and then they cut. And most serious, again, is a non-realistic understanding of what Medicaid is and does by a significant number of elected and appointed officials. So I talked about Tyler. This is Tyler's care map, and mom said she has to get me an updated one because they've got more appointments than this now. For him to go back to DC with me, he had to get approval from 18 different 
pediatric specialists. And he had to bring his oxygen, and we had to have backup batteries for his oxygen on the airplane. And this is Tyler talking to Congresswoman Anna Eshoo and showing her that above all else, he is a kid. And he is a child just like any other child. Thank you. After all these years, I understand Medicaid and Medicare and all of that, thank you. <laughs> or at least understand it better. Why do they want to do away with it? Oh. So our next speaker, also from Stanford, but previously with UCSF, where she was in fellowship in a joint UCSF-Stanford program, and I had the opportunity to work with them. Um, Lisa Chamberlain on a number of advocacy projects, including uh, things that we did with the Academy of Pediatrics in establishing the California Advocacy Committee that involves all of the residency programs throughout our state. But that's not what she's going to be talking about today. So let's get back to <laughs> <laughs> basics. And Lisa will continue to uh, enlighten us on the importance of health insurance and Medicaid for children with disabilities and special health care needs. Welcome to the podium, Dr. Chamberlain. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And I need to say that um, this is kind of coming full circle for me because I would not be able to do the work that I'm about to share with you that I do without the two women in this room, Lucy Crane and Sherry Sager. Um, as a resident, I was so uh, overwhelmed with what I saw taking care of these kids and frustrated uh, that I couldn't get kids that I cared for eyeglasses. It was actually a 17-year-old girl who I'd taken care of for a long time, real bright, bilingual, bicultural immigrant girl uh, who came to my clinic with headaches, and uh, headaches that were worse at the end of the day. This is a kid who had straight A's. She was awesome. And uh, headaches, end of the day, probably you know squinting. That's the first thing you do, check her vision. Sure enough, she needs glasses. This was the day before the Healthy Kids program. And I could not get her glasses. That's what she needed, a pair of eyeglasses. I spent months trying to figure out, because she, all she had was EPSDT, and, which meant she could be seen on intervals uh, to be cared for, but she was out of interval. And I called the Lions Club, and they had a waiting list, and I spent my own time calling different uh, providers. Finally found someone in Burlingame. And I remember the day I called her, I was so excited. I found an optometrist that's going to get you glasses. And she was like, oh, OK, uh, where is it? I said, Burlingame. And she said, oh, how will I ever get to Burlingame? Because she was down with us in East Palo Alto. And I just remember so overwhelmed. And, and feeling like, how can I practice medicine? How can I do this? I know I'm drawn to care for underserved patients, but how can I do this and not completely burn out? Because as physicians, we inherit failed social policy. That is a failed social policy that put me in that situation. And there was no way I could sustainably practice and care for this population unless I started to figure out how to change these policies and get activated around that. And that's been um, a big part of my career and what I'm gonna talk to you about in our, our last 15 minutes for this session. Um, but medical school had not prepared me to do that, not even slightly. Uh, I went to Berkeley and got a public health degree because I knew I needed those skills. And then I was graced with Sherry Sager and Lucy Crane coming into my life, both of whom took me to Sacramento. I've spent many, many evenings in Lucy's living room planning and strategizing and building capacity in pediatrics to address the policies that create the problems. Uh, so I'm not going to show you any statistics. Uh, like, I've learned a lot just listening, and I thought I knew a lot uh, about Medicaid. Um, but I'm going to tell stories about how we are working in pediatrics and how I hope we can start creating transdisciplinary action together uh, with other fields to improve the health of children. So 
the story I want to tell first is um, what happened in the uh, fall of 2016. So we'd come through a, an interesting election and were hit with a series of headlines uh, that threatened a lot of what we cared about. Uh, headlines around uh, repealing the ACA and uh, changes around immigration policy. And the pediatric residents that I work with at Stanford came to me and said, we are really worried about our families. We're hearing from our families that they are scared, that they don't want to come to clinic, that, uh, that they're going to lose their health care coverage. What can we do about this? And, and part of my job there is to talk about the social determinants of health and to teach them about health policy. And so I said, well, I don't know. Let's think. Let's, uh, let's throw it open. We've got to talk to Sherry. So it's my first call all, all the time. And she said, well, why don't we have a town hall? So we opened up a town hall, and not just to our physicians at Packard, uh, but to all staff. Uh, emails went out to everyone saying, if you're concerned about the cha changing kind of uh, prevailing wisdom coming from the East Coast right now, come talk to us. And so we held a town hall and had three quick presentations on the changes uh, around Medicaid, around immigration, and about funding for pediatric research, and then just opened it up and said, what, what, it was a group about this size, said, what do you guys want to do about it? You're people who came out on a, whatever it was, Tuesday night to talk about this. Uh, what are you interested in? And we brainstormed together for about an hour. And this group of people said, what we want to do is have a strong, coherent voice together to fight for our families and to fight for our kids. And that was the beginning of uh, what we call our, our policy response team uh, that now exists uh, down at Packard. And we kind of came together and had uh, two main goals. One was to organize and strengthen our local professional community so that we could better advocate together in a real time-sensitive way uh, when different issues came forward. And we also wanted to educate ourselves. We wanted to educate the next generation of pediatricians um, as, as well as everyone around us about uh, the important impact that these things were having on our families. <clears throat> So over the last uh, year and a half, we've taken a lot of action together. You can see some signs here uh, around different issues, DACA and CHIP being a couple big ones. And the ways we've done that, a lot of teaching sessions. So we went from having a couple policy updates a year to closer to 12. So almost every month we're having a different topic and, and teaching the residents about these issues. Um, and then the importance of what Amy said, go into those town halls. Uh, our legislators come home, they have town halls, and we not only have them on our calendar, we send emails out to everyone. There's a town hall. Who can go? Who wants to go together? Let's carpool. Let's get down there. And you can see we wear our white coats, we stand up, we talk about kids, uh, we talk about the importance of these issues. Sometimes when it's uh, Anna Eshoo's town hall, for instance, we thank her. Thank you for being a champion for children. We appreciate that. You have to um, shore up those who are uh, your champions in Washington and who consistently are a voice for the, the families that we care about. Um, and it's interesting, when you stand up and talk at these things, the media follow you out and say, excuse me, excuse me, could we, could we get a quote? Uh, and so our residents and our, our faculty have had many opportunities um, to talk and get our voice out even further. Um, and one thing I've noticed, I think it can feel intimidating to go by yourself. This idea of, you know, I'm going to look it up and I'm going to go and I'm going to speak to people. But as a group, people seem to love it. Like, okay, who can go this, this Saturday afternoon? And we'll all go grab lunch and we'll think about what's happening and then let's just all go together. And if it's your first one, you can just sit there. You don't have to say anything. Um, you know, so this idea, I think, that we're not alone. We're in this together. And we really need to start getting more organized, I think, and, and working together with this. And we would certainly welcome our colleagues who are, again, in different fields, joining us on these, because I think we can all tell those powerful stories. We are getting very organized about letter writing. We have lots of opportunities. Every single teaching conference that we do is accompanied by an opportunity to uh, send letters, to tweet, um, I'm going to get to that in a minute, uh, to get our voices out to make phone calls. Uh, but the letter writing, if, for instance, we have a grand rounds, that has a policy angle. We had one uh, recently on the increasing price of insulin uh, and just how crazy that is, uh, what's going on. And so where there's something that, again, that failed social policy that we are all inheriting, uh, we have uh, out kind of like where we signed in and got our, bag, our badges. At Grand Rounds, we have a similar table. There are letters out there 
uh, to make it easy for you. Grab one of these, take it in, write it while you're sitting in Grand Rounds, drop it off at the end, or do it at the end, and we'll get that sent for you. So just putting it in front of people, operationalizing. We could have an advocacy letter today. Uh, right? We could take advantage of the time that we're together uh, to raise our voice together, make it easy for people to address these policy issues. We've coordinated greatly with the American Academy of Pediatrics, where Lucy was an enormous leadership uh, role many years, for many years, uh, to raise our voice even more broadly and to coordinate things nationally. Uh, so one of our opportunities at, at, in California, and Lucy alluded to it, is that years ago we built a collaboration between the 14 training programs in California. And uh, I did that with Lucy, with uh, Dr. Andequo uh, and Gina Lewis, both up here, um, and reached out to the other training programs and said, hey, we, we really could have a much more powerful voice in Sacramento if we organized ourselves and if we spoke together uh, in, a, in, a, in a much more coherent way. And so we've reached out on these American Academy of Pediatrics Days of Action because that kind of is an umbrella across all of our campuses. We're all parts of the AAP. And so we take action. When they have days to take action together, uh, we make sure that every single program in California is participating. Uh, and the voice roaring out of California uh, has not been small, uh, I'm very proud to say. And, and because of all this, I am not a social media person. My daughters will tell you. I'm hopeless. Um, but uh, I have joined Twitter. And it is, it is a part of my job. It is a, um, a really important way to advocate. And I asked Lucy, I said, what's your Twitter handle for this meeting? Because I would be, I took pictures of Lucy and, and Amy standing up here. I would be tweeting about this. And people across the country who follow me would be hearing about this. I wanted to thank Kaiser for that great slide. I used that slide you used all the time. I was going to write like, I already know the tweet I'm going to send. Thank you, at Kaiser Family Foundation. You know, we continue to use your slides. But Kaiser will see that. There's somebody at Kaiser watching that today, their Twitter feed. It is in a really powerful way. And this is the very first tweet I sent up there on top. It says hashtag first tweet. So your first tweet is always followed. Um, but it's interesting because at the morning conference when we were getting the residents ready to do this Twitter storm, I said, OK, everyone get out and log on to Twitter. And they all looked at me. And I'm like, you are all on Twitter, right? And they're like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh my god. Really? And they're all on Instagram and Snapchat, which I'm aware of because I have teenage daughters. <laughs> and they're like, that's like Twitter's like for grown-ups. <laughs> which explains why I like it and I'm not on Snapchat and Instagram. Um, it, is, it is actually work. The people on Twitter are having conversations about policy, about guns, about about tax, about taxes, about it, it is it is not social in the same way that I had thought of the Facebooks and everything else. This, I really have shifted in the last six months. This is a part of my job. It is my job to get it out there. It is my job to stand for, for it. And, and the people who make decisions listen to this conversation. And that's why we have to be on it. So I would encourage you, maybe set a goal to at least talk to someone about getting on Twitter. It's really not hard at all. Um, I was surprised. So as an example of, of um, the power of Twitter, uh, the American Academy had a day of stand for chip, uh, because we were just so unbelievably frustrated with that situation. Uh, took a lot of action that day. We had good media coverage, not just at Packard, but across the state. And here are the numbers. We used two different hashtags. It's kind of how Twitter organizes their conversations. So one hashtag was hashtag don't cap my care had about 6,000 posts nationally, which means we reached 4 million individual people. Hashtag keep kids covered was the other hashtag we used. 8,000 posts, almost 9 million people. And having spent two years uh, working part-time in Sacramento, because I wanted to understand this policy better, I can tell you the staffers who d report directly to the legislators sit in front of screens with the Twitter feed over here. And they watch what's called trending. What's trending? What's everyone talking about? What is this? What is this? Don't cap my care. What is this? Uh, keep kids covered. And they will click through and they will look at our conversation. So we are, and, and on both, on this day when we did this, we trended all day long. We know we reached every single staffer on the Hill with these messages that day. And that's why this is important. That's why this matters. 
Because of this, uh, because our residents have just been unbelievably inspiring, uh, Sherry asked if, if she could take them to Washington with her on one of her trips. There's a couple of them over here on the right, Lee and Jen. Uh, so they got to go to Washington, walk the halls with Sherry, which is where I got my education. So I was real pleased uh, that they were able to do that. We've also created a story bank because the power of stories is so important. And what this is is a, a secure uh, Google Doc in our hospital that our residents uh, and uh, others, if they have stories, if they are feeling frustrated and they want to put their story down, they can. Um, here's one. Somebody put in a mother of two school-aged children with terrible oral sores was afraid to come to the doctor or the emergency room because she has an bracelet, electronic bracelet, is worried about getting deported. She was so scared to come in that by the time they arrived, both children were severely dehydrated. So we get stories all the time. It is a way for the, for the physicians and, and the caregivers to vent, to put their story down, to share what they're seeing. We have tons and tons and daily examples of people delaying coming in because of fear of immigration. We have people who delayed, the worst is a, a, a kid who got delayed getting a really important diagnosis uh, that probably changed his course. Um, and so Sherry takes these stories and she takes them to Washington and she shares them and she says this is what's happening. So we take that voice and we take it right to our, our policy makers. So the story bank has been something that's been both therapeutic I think and um, effective as an advocacy tool. So how did we do this? We got ourselves organized incredible support from our institution and I just no matter where you work I, I just would encourage you to uh, try to, to, to do something similar. Uh, we have great support from our CEO across the, um, across the without question, he supports us. Um, we send out uh, weekly emails to everyone on our policy response team um, each uh, week to tell them kind of what's going on. Here's the update from DC, et cetera. Here's how you can take action. Uh, we have these meetings. We use an app called Slack to keep ourselves organized. Sherry hates it, but it does work, I promise. Um, and I think going forward, this could really be more powerful in an interdisciplinary way. And that's what I'm excited to, to be here about today, to join forces with other voices, with our parents and our patients, because I think at that point we really would be unstoppable. And I'll just finish to say that um, quickly, this is something that I've been working on uh, for about the last 10 years, building things in California. Uh, there's the original group in California. Uh, and just a shot there of how we are in Sacramento, we'll be in Sacramento mid-April, uh, taking our voices. Um, but we're also, this model of coming together across the state is something that's kind of caught on, and it's been really fun. I'm now leading different statewide collaboratives in other places, um, and different academic programs from across states are coming together uh, to build their voice. Um, and so right now we have collaboratives in California, Missouri, North and South Carolina, and New York. Uh, I was just in Illinois last week. Uh, they're getting on board. New Jersey's actually already started, and next up is Texas. These are the states that are interested. And so the vision uh, by 2020 is that we will have 114 out of about the 200 training programs in the United States advocating uh, in the way that I've shown you that we're doing in California. Because unless we engage in the policy, uh, we are not going to um, be able to really stand and care for our children in the way that we know that we can. So I invite you all, if this kind of sparked anything, uh, to please reach out. Um, Medicaid, as Amy and Sherry have said, is so vital. It's uh, super important for children with medical complexity, and we are really at an all-hands-on-deck moment. Um, it's time to unify and speak up for kids. So this is how you can reach Sherry and I, um, as well as if you're on Twitter, yay, uh, you can follow us. Uh, and thank you again so much, and not just for the invitation, but for about 20 years of mentoring me, Lucy, and Sherry, and um, happy to take any questions that you all might have. Um.